Archaeoastronomy is one of the most intriguing and hotly debated aspects of prehistory. Our forebears left us tantalising evidence of their understanding of the cosmos and their relationship with it all over the world, from South America to Asia, Africa, Europe, to the Wiltshire Plains and Stonehenge, and, of course, the Kalanish Standing Stones way up in the Hebrides. Our guest in this short interview knows a thing or two about the stars and the galaxies. He's a cosmologist at the International School for Advanced Studies in Trieste, where he's Professor of Theoretical Physics, and he's Visiting Professor of Astrostatistics at Imperial College London. However, recently he's turned his attention to prehistory as well, and in his recent book Starburst has explored a thought experiment asking the question, what if our ancestors had never seen the stars? That simple question revealed to him just how crucial to our ancestors their relationship to the cosmos was in prehistory. And that's why we're talking to Roberto Trotter now. Roberto, welcome to Kalanish Conversations. Thank you ever so much for joining us. Uh, just to kick off with, uh, tell, uh, tell the viewers uh, about yourself, you know, who you are, what it is that you actually do in relation to astronomy. Well, such a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, I am a, an astrostatistician. That's to say I'm a cosmologist by training. So I, I studied theoretical physics at university and then I went into cosmology. So my main core academic activity is to try to understand the universe all around us, the large scale universe. So how it came to be, the origin and properties of the Big Bang. What is the universe made of? Dark matter, dark energy, all this mysterious dark stuff. And I do so using complex big data and advanced statistical methods and increasingly nowadays artificial intelligence. Right. Now, I have to confess, I haven't read it yet, uh, Roberto, but you're the author of a very successful book called Starborn. Uh, in fact, it was BBC Radio's uh, Falls Book of the, the Week uh, well, a year ago yes. when it came out in, in hardback. And I believe just, is it yesterday it was published? Yes, in paperback, yes. In paperback, uh, yeah. I mean, it's also on Kindle and uh, I think it's an audio book as well. But anyway, tell us about Starborn, uh, what it's about and, and why you think it's resonated with so many people. Yes, yeah, Starborn is a book that asks a, a rather counterfactual question. Uh, that's to say, what would have happened to us as a species had we been uh, fated to live on a planet where nobody ever saw a star? In other words, I imagine this counterfactual universe in which the Earth is exactly identical to our own, but covered forever everywhere uh, in clouds, which is perhaps not an unusual feeling for people like myself who have lived for 15 years in the UK. That's something that I can relate to. <laughs> but what about if and nobody had ever seen a star or the disk of the sun or the moon or the planets, what would have changed in our lives? And when I started digging into this question, I discovered that everything would be different. And so I uncovered a lot of subterranean, unsuspected, surprising connections between us, not just you know, how we live today in the technology and the physics and the astronomy, but us as, as people, us as species and the stars. And so I, I tried to uncover the hidden influence of the stars to, on, on us from prehistory to today. Um, you were at uh, Kalanish last June, weren't you, um, to uh, try to see the moon uh, doing its major standstill. Uh, can you explain to the viewers exactly w what the standstill is and and how it relates to Kalanish specifically? Yes, Kalanish, of course, is such a magical place. And I was lucky to, to <laughs> come back for a second visit in June uh, oh, right. 24. Uh, in fact, Kalanish was one of the inspirational places that led me to write the book in the first place. So for me, it's a very, oh. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place I'm really strongly connected with. Uh, and so in June 24, I came back uh, to witness, well, the solstice, of course, but also this perhaps even more um, unique phenomenon, which is this major lunar standstill, which happens uh, about every uh, 19 years, a little bit less. There is a cycle in the way uh, the, the moon um, moves around the Earth, and in particular, the setting and rising points of the moon, they go through a 19-year-long cycle, which was perhaps already referenced in antiquity by uh, Roman historians when they talk about the winged uh, temple of the Hyperboreans, which perhaps was a reference to Kalanish itself. And, uh, and, and the Romans talked about this mythological visit by the goddess 
uh, uh, of the, uh, to, in, in, uh, to the temple, and the goddess was perhaps the, the full moon having doing this very special thing, which can only be witnessed because of the particular location of Kalanish. Uh, during the major standstill, the moon rises uh, to the northernmost most, most point in, in its, in its uh, uh, 19 years period, and, and it uh, sets very sh uh, shortly afterwards, and it goes just skims the horizon, the old woman in the moors, uh, as seen from the tip of the Kalanish uh, stones. And that's a magical event, and one in which you know, the moon, full and very, very close to the horizon, will look huge to any observer because of the usual sort of illusion of the fact that the moon close to the horizon looks like a super moon. And imagine this moon then appearing and disappearing between uh, the stones at Kalanish, and for sure this would have, would have been an incredible event, perhaps a once-in-a-lifetime event for our ancestors and the people who built Kalanish. They were certainly aware of it. They cannot have missed it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I went back to try and catch myself, because I talk about this in the book. I was very inspired by all of these uh, references, and I wanted to experience it uh, myself. So so how was it last year? What did, what did you actually see last year? Was the weather good? Well, <laughs> well, there was a weather, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> the atmosphere was amazing. There were lots of people you know, gathering for the, for the solstice itself and the double whammy of the, of the major uh, standstill. So we stayed out the night. There was a camera was rigged up. There was a, a live stream. Uh, there was, you know, people singing, dancing, chanting, doing rituals, whatnot. You know, a very colorful cr crowd, shall we say. But the moon just briefly, ever so briefly appeared between the clouds. We were hopeful that it would clear up in time, but it just didn't. And we did get this tantalizing glimpse of the full moon. So it was there, we could see it, but we didn't get the full experience, I'm afraid. So it's, you know, 19 years, more than 19 years wait, I'm afraid. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Till the next time. I'll tell you what, more, more generally, uh, Roberto, what role do you think the stars took in the lives of our prehistoric ancestors? Mm. And do you think you can speculate on the impact that awareness of the cosmos may have had on them? Mm. That's, that's a question that I, I investigated in some depth in my, in my book, because of course when we yeah. think about the influence of the stars on history, then many, many things come immediately to mind, you know, astronomy and from there physics and therefore technology depended on the stars, navigation, timekeeping, all of the early calendars were lunar calendars. So there are many, many things that come to mind in terms of our historical connection with the stars, and those are well documented. But, you know, to me, perhaps the most fascinating part was trying to go deeper and, and further back in history to prehistory, when, of course, traces become scant and the evidence has to be interpreted and, and hypotheses uh, find uh, very little confirmation. But in my opinion, the stars played a major role in establishing our supremacy over the Neanderthals um, about 50,000 years ago. The big mystery of why are we here? Why are the Neanderthals not the dominant human species on the planet? After all, they've, they've had 600,000 years head start over us uh, before we came along and, and trotted out of Africa. They were superior physically. They were, you know, uh, uh, Olympians essentially compared to us. Uh, a handshake by a Neanderthals could crush the bones of your hand. And they were not the brutes that they, were, that they used to be depicted uh, as. They, are, they were actually uh, skilled uh, craft people. Uh, they had control of fire. They used art and probably also buried their dead. So intellectually, they were, they were perhaps our equals um, in, in many respects. So why did they uh, disappear 42,000 years ago when, when we coincidentally started colonizing Europe? And I believe that a knowledge and an awareness of the stars really played a major part for our species, because if you think about about it, being able to interpret in some intuitive fashion the reappearance of stars over the seasons, the full moon period, and so on, would give our ancestors evolutionary, crucial evolutionary advantage in terms of finding resources, navigating, knowing when to predict the migration of uh, birds and other animals, and the availability of resources, natural resources like food. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you can somehow connect the period in the heavens to what happens to the nature around you, you're going to have a major evolutionary advantage. And my hypothesis, for which I try to find some supporting evidence in the book, is that Homo sapiens did have this advantage, and that was a crucial part in determining our survival when the going got tough with uh, rapidly changing uh, weather and climate and ice ages mm -hmm. coming and going. The Neanderthals had seen it all before. We didn't. 
but we survived and they didn't. I can't wait to read the book now, Roberto. Indeed, yeah. And that's uh, that's fa fascinating stuff. It's just what, one more thing. Um, we often find ourselves, R Rupert and I, when we're talking about anything to do with archaeoastronomy, we try to reiterate and land for people the fact that our relationship to the sky is profoundly different to uh, any relationship that they had back then because... We don't look at it. We don't see it. And, you know, you're saying <laughs> uh, living in a cloudy UK are un un unlikely. But even even then, you know, uh, uh, a starry night sky without light pollution is a very very different experience. And so, do do you ha do you sa can you say anything about how you feel um, uh, many people in prehistory had a, a much closer relationship to the cosmos in the first place. Absolutely. I think this is crucial in many respects because the stars and the heavens have always exerted an incredible fascination on humankind throughout history. And it's only in the last 150 years or so that we started losing that because we are no mm -hmm. longer able to see the sky. You know, in our major cities, we don't see the sky anymore. We don't care about it. And the paradox of our age is that, of course, these beautiful pictures of the deep cosmos are within the finger, our fingertips, you know, a click away on the internet, yet we no longer know any of the actual lived experience of the sky. And I believe that that had a profound influence on our ancestors, not just for, for their survival, as we discussed, but also psychologically, you know, spirituality, all of the big gods always lived in the sky. And that could, the, the beauty and the majesty and the mystery of the night sky could not have failed to deeply impress themselves upon our collective psyche. And I think we've lost that consciously, but unconsciously is still there somewhere. And if we can yeah. bring it back and relate back to the skies and go yeah. out and find dark skies and, and recapture a little bit of that wonder and awe, and awe I think we would all be better served for it. Roberto, I feel there are further conversations afoot, but I feel, I think, <laughs> yes. for, for the moment, this one uh, uh, must draw to an end. Um, thank you so much for being uh, with us. It's, uh, even these few minutes have been absolutely fascinating uh, d talking to you. So, uh, yeah, most grateful. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks ever so much, Roberto. And uh, and yes, we'll, uh, we'll we'll continue this conversation another time. <laughs> Thanks very much. You take care.